the two things, counseling and medication. They can't do one without the other at the VA. Mm-hmm. They want to give you a pill. Yeah. Want to give you a pill to fix it. Want to make life easy again. But it goes back to, for us, it's that you trade it one death for another. Mm-hmm. And that we would love to see an alternative. Mm-hmm. I mean, eventually you ask, hey, what, what are the goals? Where, do, where does H&H mm-hmm. want to go? We would love to see there's an alternative at the VA that, hey, guys, you can try the traditional route or you can try this. Right. Come come to Montana to the back country for 40 days mm-hmm. and see what happens. All right. Let's do this. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Hunt Harvest Health Podcast. This is Dr. Hillary Lampers. I'm so glad that you're here. It's been a crazy few months for us. And we just, a couple of days ago, our house closed. And we are officially um, on to our next project. I've been in Montana for a few weeks with the kids and starting a new job. And Ryan has spent a lot of time in the mountains. So we haven't even seen each other in about a month now. I don't know, maybe over a month now. And so this week I am back in Seattle for work for one week. And so I will be seeing him. And I hope that that means that we are going to be able to give uh, you all some podcasts together. That would be my goal. Um, He has been on some fabulous trips, doing some filming, doing some hunting for himself. And I'm sure he has a lot of stories to tell. So maybe I can get him to sit down if he's not having to work like a crazy man since he's been gone um, and share some of those stories with you guys this season. Also, if you haven't already, make sure to follow Project Waypoint on Instagram. That is the project Ryan is working on with a few other buddies uh, uh, around this season. It is one of a kind thing because Ryan has really never videoed his hunting experiences for the last 30 years. So he's going to be doing a lot of sharing this year and giving a lot of wisdom and just, I mean, you're going to kind of see him in action. So I know a lot of you out there have wanted that and he's been kind of, I guess I would say he... He's been um, apprehensive to do that just by his nature and kind of who he is as an introvert. So it's, again, stepping out of another comfort zone for him, which I think is really great. And it just helps to make him a better person. And it continues to grow our community, which we love. Um, Speaking of community, today's podcast is um, one of my favorites. I have to say that um, I have a real fondness for people who especially people who are doing things out there to help others without the expectation of great wealth, um, of money anyways. And, and they're looking to change the world and create a great wealth of serving and again, serving that, that their communities in which they're involved with. Um, Rick Franco, who is the chief operating officer of an organization outside of Bozeman in Manhattan, Montana called Heroes and Horses, contacted me through Instagram when I first moved to Bozeman and just said, Hey, so glad you're here. You know, we really love what you're doing. And if you have time, check out our organization and what we're up to and going to their website. I was just immediately struck by, um, the content and actually what they're doing. And it was really funny. I'll tell the story in the podcast here about how I came across the movie that they made last year called 500 miles. And I came across it on YouTube. It was just a random thing. And I watched it. And then when Rick introduced himself and when I went to that website, I was like, God, this looks so familiar. Where have I seen this before? And sure enough, I had, I had been really, um, watching this for the last year and it kind of got set to the side, but we've done some other podcasts where we've talked about, um, the issues with veterans in in today's society. And, And really, I think in in society in general, as our, our wound, our warriors come back home and they have a very difficult time reintegrating back into society. Many are diagnosed with conditions like PTSD. And as you've heard in the media quite a bit, you know, over 20 veterans a day are committing suicide. And this is tragic. This is tragic that men and women are going onto the front lines and into combat and et cetera, giving of themselves. And uh, they're coming back with such severe 
emotional, mental, physical traumas. And so I think that this podcast today um, was for me a real eye opener to organizations, nonprofits especially, that are designated to help veterans, but that a lot of these programs are not actually fully rehabilitating veterans. And this is the difference with Heroes and Horses is that it's not just a vacation, they say. Their hashtag is not a vacation. And that's because many of the existing programs offered today, especially those suffering from PTSD, they're not very realistic and sustainable. And so what Heroes and Horses has has done is they're trying to combat this over-medication of prescription drugs and shielding veterans from stress-inducing situations by actually creating a challenge, creating intenseness in their life. And they're doing that by using wild Mustangs and their relationship with them and then traveling into the back country. It's, uh, they just, the day that I talked to Rick, he was leaving to go pick up, um, the group of 24 guys this year that were part of the program that had been in the back country for 40 days. If you haven't already, I would highly recommend that you go to the website heroesandhorses.org. You can check out what they're doing. You can also find a lot of stuff on them on YouTube, uh, movies, and etc. cetera. Um, Mike Fink, who is the founder, he's the CEO, he's really the, um, the mastermind behind this whole concept. He was a, a Navy SEAL, and he was a president at 9-11. He has a great YouTube video from Ted, a Ted talk that he did in Bozeman, as well as um, a number of other movies that he recorded. One with Yeti and then their 500 uh, miles. That one is great. Just talks about what he's doing, why he's doing this. And then um, in this podcast, you'll learn about how Rick and Micah, how they, how they've known each other for years and how they've worked together and why they're working together um, to change veterans lives for the good. So it's one of my favorite podcasts. If you find so in your heart to, to donate, they function mainly off donations. If you're a horse person and you know the healing capacity that horses have, um, on your life, um, consider donating. You can donate your time. You can donate money. You can donate goods. Um, Rick will go over that somewhat. The other part of this story is we talk a lot about the horses and how these wild Mustangs have kind of been, uh, they don't have a purpose. And so how they are working to bring purpose, not only back to these veterans lives, but to bring purpose back to these horses. So it's, it's a pretty powerful story. Okay. If you have, if you want to watch some of the videos, I'll put those links on the, um, on the show notes page, as well as any other related links here. Um, you can do that by going to huntharvesthealth.com slash podcast slash heroes and horses. Okay. Enjoy. I miss it. No, keep, so, so tell me that story. So the reason I ended up contacting you is yeah. for a couple of years in Iowa, I'd been listening to your podcast, kind of getting into podcasts because I'd never really got into them. And then your podcast, which I'm probably going to mess up the name, but it was the mistress that stole my husband, I believe, or the mistress that stole. I actually always miss that, mess that up too. And it, uh, so I read this, I read the article, but then mm-hmm. I also put it in one day when I went for a run because we lived on a great gravel road in Iowa and I was, you know, running, always wanted to do the backcountry hunting. Um, I've hunted a lot. That guy right there is mine. I've got oh. more of these guys and uh, more African stuff than. Oh, okay. Than, I don't have one of those. Oh, you don't? But I have. <laughs> so there's I, a zebra here, folks. And he doesn't a, have an elk, but he has a zebra. Well, but I have a plethora of African animals. They're all in Des Moines right now, up at Shields. But uh, so I, I listened to that and it really resonated with me. I was like, this is a great, in fact, so much so I sent it to my wife. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not sure if she's read it yet, but it made a lot of sense. And so I knew who you guys were. Okay. Um, and then, I don't know, I guess what, only three weeks ago, maybe we got con- you contacted me or I saw you guys were moving to Bozeman. Mm-hmm. But I didn't even do anything until I saw 
one day on the Instagram, like, Hunt Hard as Hell started following you. I was like, hey, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I, but no reason. I didn't know why or what I thought it was cool. I guess like we all do, like, oh, that's a cool post. I'll follow that. Right. So that was when I saw that. Then I saw you guys were moving to Bozeman. Um, I was like, well, let me reach out because part of my job here at Heroes and Horses as a COO is to make new contacts, create awareness of our program and what we do. Right. And I thought, well, you guys move in both, and let me just, in a shot, just, you know, fire one across the bow <laughs> and see if you'll respond, if you guys will respond. Well, the cool thing is, and I don't know what my microphone's doing. I think I'm just going to leave it alone. <laughs> so... Y'all, I normally have my headsets, but Ryan has those, and I'm using our old school equipment. So please don't complain to me about audio. I'm going to do the best I can with editing. But, um, you know, once in a while, we'll kind of follow random people. I don't know, and it's maybe sometimes people like us. And I know Ryan is much better at this than I am, probably because I have too many jobs. But he'll go through, like, his, his people follow him or mm. follow, he'll go through and he'll look at those people and then he'll kind of decide, like, is this somebody I want to follow? Sure. I do the same thing. Yeah. And I, I don't think I do that very much. I just kind of go, oh, I like that follow, follow, follow. <laughs> you know? And then sometimes in my feed, it's like, why am I following this person? Unfollow, you know. But um, what's interesting is that you reached out to us, to me through Instagram and said, Hey, I'd like you to check out our thing. And then, you know, we've got this gala coming up in Bozeman and welcome to Bozeman. And I was like, Oh, that's awesome. So I went to the website and I was looking at the front page and I saw Micah on there, who is the, he's the founder founder. Yep. And we'll talk more about him and the, obviously the mission and everything, but I was like looking through it and I kept thinking, oh, this seems so familiar. Like, where have I seen this before? And then I went to the tab 500 miles, which I believe is the, the short film that was made. Uh, I don't know when was this, the film made couple, last, last year. year last so it was year. new. Yeah. And I clicked on it and I was like, oh, so I don't know, six months, eight months ago, I don't know, somebody else on Instagram had posted this thing about this short film called 500 Miles. I went on YouTube, I watched the whole film, and I remember telling Ryan, this is so cool what these guys are doing. We, it would be so cool to have them on a podcast. And then when I, I kind of, it kind of went out of my mind. And then when I went back to the website, I saw the video. I said, oh, my gosh, this is the video I watched eight months ago and said, you know, it would be so cool to have them on a podcast. So I think things really do come full circle. Oh, absolutely. And, they happen for reasons. Yeah. I mean, I see that more and more every day that mm -hmm. I'm here. It's just not not to sound corny or anything, but it, it does happen. I mean, the dots are being connected for reasons. Mm -hmm. And in this community... Um, in the outdoor community, in the hunting community. Um, it's like that in my community, the health community. It's, a, it's actually a very small world. And I think with the podcasting format and the platforms that people are building, social media, it allows people to get to know each other more than you ever could have before. You know, before, if I wanted to talk with you or talk to Micah, you know, I might have had to call somebody and be like, this is what I do. And can I make an appointment to come in to yep. see? And I may or may not have, there may or may not have been enough interest or, you know, media. And so I think, I think today it's just, it can sometimes be overwhelming. It's like social media can just sometimes it's like, I want to go back to the time when there was no social media, no phones, like, but at the same time, it's, it's really amazing for this kind of stuff and it making is. connections and that's what Ryan and I feel we've gotten with social media is we've met so many amazing people that have also supported us and like you yep. sent us wonderful comments. And then that in turn, um, I will say that I'm always more interested in learning about somebody's mission or what their business is or what their, um, I'm, I don't want to say trying to sell, but what are they doing if they send me a personal message sure. and they create that? And that's, that's why I um, am here, obviously. <laughs> Well, okay. we're glad you're here. It's our, I think this is only our second podcast ever as an organization. Really? Yeah. Who was your first one? I'd have to ask you know? Sierra. I don't know. Micah did one 
one prior to this, and I don't know who it was with. I'll have to find out. Okay. Uh, I, she told me, but I've got a million things that come in and out of the head every day, so that one didn't stick with me. I find that I find that really uh, fascinating that this is only the second podcast is, you guys is, have done because the story is really profound. The story needs to be out there. It, it does. It is a yeah. So I've only been here six months, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my background if you want to get into that. Yeah, so let me do just kind yeah. of a formal introduction. Yeah. We haven't even said where we are. Um, I am currently sitting in the office of Heroes and Horses in Manhattan, Montana. Go figure. <laughs> uh, and uh, Rick here, who reached out to us, we were just talking about that through Instagram, uh, saw that, that I'd moved here to Bozeman. And he um, reached out. So I went online. Like I said, I'd watched the movie before 500 Horses or 500 miles. miles. It's about wild Mustangs. It's about the repurposing of wild Mustangs. Right. And using veterans, uh, using this as therapy for veterans. Yep. Um, and the 500 means it's a, it was a 500-mile backcountry trip through the mountains of... It started in... Arizona, Arizona, through New Mexico to get these wild Mustangs that we got out of Oregon off BLM land mm-hmm. uh, for about $35 a piece. Wow. And the 500 miles was their test of the horses to get them ready for a class of veterans coming in. I got you. So they were basically getting the horses ready for this program we're going to talk about. Exactly. Here. Well, that's a really uh, profound movie. I, I watched it. And I had absolutely no idea what this program was, and I I was really touched by it. I think also also the film was really well done. Whoever made the film did a really good job. Um, But going on the website and reading more about what your mission is, I was like, oh, I need to talk to these guys. I think that sometimes there's a lot of – well, I know because we've worked with other organizations. We've talked to other people who are involved with veterans and veteran affairs and helping to rehabilitate veterans from trauma, PTSD, et cetera. But um, your mission statement and what you're all about is very different from what anything I've seen before. It, it and, is. We're the, we're the only kind of, of – I'm not going to call it treatment. Mm-hmm. We're the only program like this in the nation. There are 45,000 veteran nonprofits across the U.S. That was, that's a, st- a statistical number that we looked at. Um, they all do great things, but we're the only one that is 40 days long, and we live to our hashtag, not a vacation. These guys do not get a break, and that's just to start phase one and phase two, and we'll talk about the whole program yeah. as we go on, and, but then there's a whole follow-on phase, a reintegration phase. So in essence, you're looking at a nine-week program hmm. for these guys. Yeah, let's let me just read a little bit of your mission statement because yeah. I think it's a really great mission statement, and um, it it really defines what you guys are trying to do. So, the Heroes and Horses mission: Heroes and Horses is a Montana-based nonprofit organization that has created an innovative three-phase reintegration program, which is offered to qualifying combat veterans at no cost to them suffering from PTSD. Our program utilizes the remote wilderness of Montana, coupled with human and horse connections, to challenge and inspire personal growth in veterans suffering from mental and physical scars. I mean, wow, that kind of says it all right there. It does. What we're doing is we're redefining the relationship between challenge and purpose for these guys. You, You boil it down, that mission statement right there, plus redefining the challenge and the purpose. And we and we're not making cowboys. We're not making outfitters out of them. It's just, it's our medium. Mm-hmm. We're here in Montana, and it works. The mountains, the horses, the mules, the packing, the backcountry, because I'm sure Ryan can attest to this. There's stuff out there that will kill you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, instantly fall off a cliff, horse roll over the side, bears, you name it. It's Rattle out there. Rattlesnakes. <laughs> yeah, it's out there. Yeah. Um, so we're just using our process, which is innovative and comprehensive, Um to challenge these guys. And I say guys because right now we are, it's just men, men combat combat vets. Um, and we use the wilderness, the horse-human connection, because that is a proven scientific connection that happens between a human being and a horse. Uh, and then proven leadership. And all that combined into this program 
changes lives. Mm -hmm. And I'll read you some things that I just got a testimonial yesterday from one of the program vets from this year, a 67-year-old Vietnam veteran. He was the oldest guy in our class to come through, and he made it all the way through. And he's coming back to the gala. So you'll, if you're at the gala, you'll meet you'll meet him. Okay. Um, and he, at some point, I'll read this just excerpts from his testimonial. But talk about moving and just defining at, at, at its best. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. You got to get closer to the microphone. <laughs> Because I want to get all this. I don't want to miss any. And like I said, these microphones. Um, So tell us, okay, before we get into the actual program, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and then tell us a little bit about Micah, who's the actual founder of Heroes and Horses. So that's a good thing we only have an hour and 15 minutes (laughs) because that's a loaded question. Yeah. All right. So um, my background is... I'm a kid originally from South Louisiana. However, I was fortunate enough to grow up all over the world. My father was in oil. Um, fast forward, decided I was going to go in the military. Always knew it. Grew up. I'm a kid of the 80s. I watched Wolverine and wanted to be Rambo and <laughs> No Surrender, all those things. Yeah, you know, me too. U.S. propaganda at its finest. I didn't finest. want to be Rambo, but, but, it, but it it worked. Um, yeah. So I enlisted in the Marine Corps in 1993. Okay. I was going to school at the same time. I graduated and then got commissioned in 1995 as a infantry officer in the Marines. I spent the next uh, spent my time doing that till about 2002 when uh, I got out. Of course, 9/11 was just happening, but I was already scheduled to get out. And then I jumped right back in the reserves and did some reserve time with the Marines. But it was during that time that I kind of fell into the world that brought me right here, right now, sitting in this room, and how how I met Micah, how we met. In 2002, I, I, uh, let me back up, 2004, pardon me, I fell into the government contracting world mm-hmm. for a one of our organizations in the government. Uh, starts with three letters. I did that for, I think I counted yesterday in preparation for this, almost 15 years consecutively I've been in a combat zone. I just stopped. In 17, I had two, what you'd call two breaks in service. In 2005, I shattered my lower leg and it took a year and a half to walk. So I wasn't doing that. And then I went back and from 2008 to 2014, I went straight. Uh, I was straight back overseas again. I took a one year break when I met my wife and decided, okay, I'm going to try and live a normal life and get out and, um, but that didn't – we went to the Bahamas for a year. So that was a good break. Yeah. That's wow. – working in the that's Bahamas. That's a nice is, break. Yeah. Working in the Bahamas is not too bad. But it's not also – it's not all paradise either. Uh, that's a whole separate story. Um, came back to Des Moines uh, because that's where the family is from and looked for about six months. And then the proverbial bat phone rang. And it was the guys from my old unit calling me and saying, hey, you want to come back? And I said, well, let's talk about that. And they said – made a few offers. I said, yep, I'll be back. So my wife and I decided that I'd go back for a couple of years and I did two more years. And then finally last year in 17, I decided that I really like my wife. I love my two kids. <laughs> I've done a lot, seen a lot, but if I want to keep them, I got to stop. We have to stop. So I did. Um, it was during that time. Let me say, so that's continual time in a combat zone all over the world, lots of places, doing all sorts of very unique, very interesting things with some of the finest Americans I've ever been with. Uh, I've lost during that time. I've seen it. Uh, It's probably what has somewhat drawn me here to do this. Um, So Micah Fink, the founder, uh, Navy SEAL, he'll be be sure to tell you he's a Navy SEAL. Mm -hmm. So we we have a pretty good banter going between the Marines and the Navy. But, um, Micah came to work actually for me in 2012 because when I started doing the contracting, I kind of came through the proverbial ranks and rose to the top. So by 2012, I was the lead contractor for the country of Afghanistan uh, for that time. And Micah Fink came to work for me uh, during that period. I first met Micah 
I was like, wow, that's a big guy. And, uh, but I'd, by that time I'd worked with lots of seals. So I, I was neither right nor wrong. So seal community out there, guys, I love you. Uh, but you know, you all have a reputation. It's not good or bad. It's just a reputation of being a seal. Um, so Micah and I, uh, he worked for me. He was with me on a couple of missions. He was part of my team. We were, yes, I ran the country, but we were also colleagues and coworkers. And we, our mission was very, our, the mission of the organization I was with and the unit I was with was very unique. It's two guys and that's it. Hmm. And doing a lot of things. Um, so that's how I first learned to meet Micah. And ironically, or I guess we say all the dots connect. I was with Micah when Heroes and Horses was born. Mm. We were, you know, I being over, being overseas in 2012, 2013, he would come because he, he stayed where I was staying. And he said, hey, Rick, what do you think about this organization I'm going to start? And I can remember Heroes and Horses being on a cocktail napkin. We're in the mm. team room sitting with our feet up, watching some movie or something, eating popcorn, Have probably had a dip in at the time when I did you. And I was like, Micah, I'm an outdoors. I'm, I rode horses for a little bit, uh, but I'm no cowboy. I said, you, you're from New York. What the hell do you know about riding horses? <laughs> and so, yeah, I was there the whole time. I saw the logos. The, this is the logo you see on the wall. That's not the original logo. You got to stay up. That's not the original logo. The original logo is probably on this yeah. picture right here, Hillary. The, the hand drawn oh, one. Oh yeah. So I was there when that was drawn. Wow. And it's um, I think it's just really neat how it all comes full circle. So that's how I first met Micah, and then when I left in 2014, um, I believe he left also. I think 2014 may have been his last year there. You can see on the wall the awards. You can. Mm-hmm. You can read those organizations, and yeah. he's got one. So do I. Two separate incidents, but we were both uh, awarded different things at the time. Hmm. So that's how I met Micah. Fast forward to 2017. Decided to quit contracting. I'm back in Des Moines looking for a job, uh, hitting all my buddies up, and who's got what. And I was slated originally to go to Utah um, for to do a private security be a private security detail leader for a family in Utah that kept going and going and going. And the day that the contract finally didn't happen, I got a phone call from DC saying, Hey, it's not happening uh, through a separate company. My wife and I do what, you know, all good people do. We threw a pity party for ourselves. (laughs) It's like, okay, let's, you know, want to crack a beer. It's noon. Why not? Let's, you know, come on. We're good people. Give us an answer. And I'm not really joking when I say, I was really frustrated. I said, come on, give me an answer. Somebody, why am I not getting anything? The phone rings. Oh. It's Micah. He's like, hey, buddy, what are you doing? I'm like, hey, man, I haven't talked to you in probably a couple of years. What's going on? He's like, you want to come be my COO? I said, Bozeman? And I was familiar with Bozeman because mm-hmm. I had friends who work in the outdoor industry here. Uh, ironically, a lot of there's quite a few guys from our community that are out in this area. So I'd always been familiar with Montana and Bozeman. I said, well, let's fly me out. Let's take a look. And we flew out. My wife and I flew out. And by the weekend, Mike and I shook hands, hugged, and I said, I'll see you in two weeks. Wow. And so here I am, six months later, three classes later, running our program. So it's only you've only been here six months. Yeah. October will be seven. Wow. Yeah, you're very new to this then. Uh, and how long has Heroes and Horses been going on? How, when Heroes did Micah and Horses, start it? For 2014. Okay. So four years. Yeah, four years. We're four years young. Four years young. Yeah, you're very young. Um, I think that, I, you know, I'm not a veteran. I, um, I had family members. My, great, my grandfather on my dad's side couldn't go to work because he had polio as a kid and he had a deformed foot. And he couldn't go to war, to World War II. But my, he was very proud of a letter that he had received from the president at that time because in that day and age, everybody wanted to go to war. And so he had written a letter to, uh, I don't know who you wrote back then, to the Defense Department De- yeah, or the probably. president 
saying, I'm of ample body, I can play sports, I can run, I can go to war, like my friends can. Yeah. And they wrote him a letter back and said, we truly appreciate your desire to help your country, but we still can't take you. And he had that letter for many years in his in, in, in a folder, and he would show that to people. And I always remember thinking, wow, I'm really glad my grandpa didn't go to war, right? Sure. World yeah. War II. Yeah. But... Um, and then my my mom's dad was a Korean veteran. Uh, he went to Korea and he died. He was 25. He died of a of a different problem. But he was the other. I guess he was the only real veteran. Um, and I never knew him in in the family. But um, so I didn't grow up in a military family at all. Uh, my dad did not he, get his draft number picked during Vietnam, and so he did not go to Vietnam. But I've always been tre- been intrigued by the idea of joining the military yeah. and serving. And what is it about that, that, um, you know, what is that choice that makes you decide to do that? And then obviously moving up in the ranks here and doing it, you know, Mike is a Navy SEAL, you're top Marine. Like what, what drives, what drives you, you? To, to do that? Because to me, it seems um, maybe it's testosterone that drives you to do that. And <laughs> that's the reason they're recruiting 18-year-old boys because you don't oh, have sure. a sense of mortality. Uh, but, you know, there's there's people that are drawn to it and there's people that aren't. And That's a good question. You know, first of all, I'm, I'm the first one in my family ever to join the military. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, nobody on my father's side had because my father was from Venezuela. So he he wasn't a, he was a citizen, but you know yeah. obviously wasn't going to be in the military. And then on my mother's side, uh, my grandfather didn't go to World War II because he was an engineer, and they told him you need to stay back, and ha- we need you to design things. Right. And then my uncle, he didn't get drafted for Vietnam. Um, I'm not sure why, but anyway, long story short is I was the only I'm the only one so far in my family to have gone in the military. Um. And the done it the whole way. I mean, I went to a military school. Then I enlisted. Mm-hmm. Then I became commissioned. And, and what drives you? So what, what drove me to it was probably the, the idea or the thought that people said you couldn't do something. And I think it's a very innate feeling. So I was a real skinny kid. Mm. You know, got the proverbial chicken legs and, you know, pipe cleaners for arms Kind of looked like the um, the actor in Captain America before he becomes Captain America. <laughs> That's kind of how I felt as a kid. Um, and so that that uh, that drove me. That really did. It drove me to say, "You tell me I can't do it. Watch this. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do it. Hook or crook, you know, I'm going to die getting it done." Um. And I, I joked at the beginning of the podcast, you know, as a kid of the 80s and watched, you know, Chuck Norris and Rambo and Wolverine, all those movies. I mean, we played guns as kids and we played Army and Soldier. Mm-hmm. And uh, I probably shouldn't admit this on a podcast. I, at 15, I took a diving class as a kid uh, to get scuba certified. And the instructor was a Navy diver and he talked about these guys, Navy SEALs mm-hmm. and what they did. And I was like man, I think I could be one of those. And then, um, I do remember though, when we were kids, so you and I are probably exactly the same age around close to the same age. Uh, Like I remember when we were little and I had a brother, I mean like GI Joe, um, all the cartoons that were on TV were all superheroes. Oh yeah. All military military, guys, GI Joe, very masculine Um, kind of, this is the, this is, what it is. Yeah, I, 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 I just remember it kind of like always the thing. It was either the G.I. Joe soldiers or the trucks, you know, if you were or, or here in Montana, you cowboys, you know, that yeah. was another thing. Cowboys and Indians. Yeah. We <laughs> and, played the same. <laughs> but I, I feel like that was much more so than today. Uh, we, I, is there even GI Joe anymore? Do we see well, any a type of military like in children? You don't see. You can't any even of that play on... with guns nowadays. No. It's not even like acceptable. But I feel like when we were young, that was. Um, That's what you did as a very kid. Common. Yeah, yeah, it was very common. It was all over. I mean, I honestly don't think I've seen a GI Joe cartoon on TV or anything that portrays 
I hate to use the word violence, mm-hmm. but violence to a certain degree or aggressiveness. You, mm-hmm. you know, I think about what my kids watch on TV and I don't really see any of that. Um, yeah. There's a lot of different type of violence nowadays yeah. that we see that I think is, you know, not good either. But, um, so yeah, continue on with that. Like, so with so that, that drive, that drive, it was just, I th- having seen a lot of guys come through the service, um, commanded men on my commanded my own troops, my own men. It's something you see. I, it's, it's hard to quantify. It's almost like this program. It's hard to quantify what works, but it's a combination of things. I think it's the same thing for guys in our shoes. So Mike and I probably fall into 1% of 1% mm-hmm. to climb the ranks. You know, not only so Mike as a Navy SEAL, extremely some of the toughest training on the planet in the military to get into and to be successful at. Myself as a Marine infantry officer, and then getting out of that and going into a specialized program for a specialized organization. The training to get in the door is extremely tough. And the training to stay in the club, so to speak, is extremely mm-hmm. tough. I'm going to say it's less than 1%, 1%. Mm. Because everybody's some sort of special operations, this or that, to just get a pass to come to the door and try out. Then you got to make it. Mm-hmm. Then you got to stay proficient and do it. And then you got to climb. You know, if you're, and then for me, I just, I climbed. Um, and that's, it's a, it's a drive. Uh, and I was always very patriotic. Mm-hmm. I think part of that comes from being overseas for the first part of my life seeing the underprivileged, seeing what people don't have. I mean, we here in this country, and I'm not going to get on a big soapbox, but so many people here take what we have for granted. Mm -hmm. Go to another country Mm -hmm. and see a starving kid dying on the street. Mm -hmm. Watch them. I mean, I've I've seen one of my first trips to Afghanistan, there was a, a mother in a hijab. So the hijab, for those that don't know, is a, the head-to-toe covering, the mm-hmm. the ninja outfit, laying – it's cold this time of year. It's like March. Laying in a puddle. Pretty sure she's dead because she's laying down, covered, I mean, just there, and a toddler just crying beside her. Mm-hmm. That's – if that doesn't move you or hurt you, you got no feelings. Mm-hmm. So we shouldn't take what we have for granted here. Are we a perfect society? By no means. But I've seen a lot of that, not only as an adult in, in combat zones, but as a kid growing up. Nepal, India, Abu Dhabi, Dubai. Just I was fortunate, blessed that my family traveled a lot because of my father's work. He was in the oil field. So we went to all these developing countries. So I think part of that, when I came back to the States at 13, you know, testosterone was starting to flow. You're starting mm-hmm. to feel things. I was like... I just wanted to serve my country. Yeah, yeah, and you want to help those people. I wanted to help. I wanted to yeah. serve. And I think it goes back to who we are. There are certain people and there are certain types of people who are warriors, who are teachers, mm-hmm. who are servers, who are helpers. And so it depends on what class, I guess, or what you <laughs> fall into. For me, I'm probably falling into that warrior, teacher, server mode. Mm-hmm. And that's who I am. It's just... At, at my age, at 46 now, I'm kind of self-discovered, self-aware, finally self-aware of who I am, what I am, and what my purpose is. Right. And that's that's a big thing that we talk about in the program, purpose. Um, how guys lose their purpose yeah. and how to find it again. If you had the choice today to go back to war or go back to what you were doing before, would you? It's tempting. Very tempting What's at times. What's tempting about it? The camaraderie. Okay. The camaraderie. Uh, there is a rush. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can jump out of a plane. You can ski down a hill. You mm-hmm. can do all these. Whatever your adrenaline is, there is a rush. Combat guys will tell you. It's scary, mm-hmm. but it's also a rush, you know, after the first time. there, there There's a rush there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's tempting. And you know, the other side of it is there for me is when I was contracting, it was a financial gain too. Right. Very big. So the temptation between the camaraderie, the adrenaline, and the money, that's that's a drug within itself. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but I know that that drug leads to one place eventually. And I'd rather be around to play baseball or more importantly, take my kids hunting. You know, we shot bows yesterday That's and they're, they're huge archers and at three and five, they're mm-hmm. shooting targets. So I want to take my kids on their first hunt before I'm too old. And that's why I want to be here. Yeah. And, And, you know, it's the same thing like addictions. And I think tendency why you just keep needing that dopamine hit, right? You get addicted to it and you keep needing more and more and more. And it takes more to now get the same type of effect. And so um, that can be very depressing as you start realizing that it's not fulfilling you maybe the same way as it did before. Or you're neglecting a lot of your other life to get that dopamine hit, you know, it's finding that balance. And once you realize, and and it, and it takes discipline. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's so easy to go back. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to do a few things, but it would be easy to go back. Mm -hmm. I've been asked to go back. So I'm, I'm also in, in my background, I'm very interested in neurology and brain health. And I, if I wasn't a naturopath, uh, I probably would be a neurologist or even maybe a psychologist or something like some, some field like that where you deal with brain uh, function. Because I find it very interesting, um, especially with if you talk about different types of people and um, how they perceive different things and how their brain is either traumatized or not by certain events. And in the military, it seems that uh, there's this high sense of patriotism and in, in people that go in, yep. they have a high sense of, um, I think that they want to help people, right? Like you experience suffering. So you want to go in and help those people in this way. Um, you want to serve your country and uh, be of service to others. Um, but what is it on the flip side when now you've, You've gotten to those places, you've done those things, and you've also experienced some pretty rough traumas that had you just stayed at home, you you wouldn't have experienced in your life. And how do those traumas change your perception of the military or what you've actually done with your life? Because I know the camaraderie, it sounds like to me, is, is one of the big things men miss and women because you're in a group of peers that have the same goal and they same had the goal, same like-mindedness brain function yep. as you and they wanted those same things in their life but now on the flip side they've experienced things and gone through things and had traumas that may be staying with them for the rest of their life that may do them more harm than good do you understand my question uh, I, I do it's I, like a dichotomy where we yeah. say you should be a patriot and go to war for your country, but these things can happen do to these you. Good things, but you may have to actually end up doing horrible things or witnessing horrible things that, for the rest of your life, may take a toll on you. Are you ready to do that? And are you willing to do that? And I think no one understands that. I think yeah. when you sign on the dotted line, the proverbial dotted line, and you raise your hand, you really don't know what you're getting into. Mm-hmm. It, you know, it's, it's kind of like having kids. You think yeah. you know about having kids until you have a kid, right? And then you have to experience it. So it to me, it's, it's a great analogy because it's the same thing. They'll tell you everything, but you really don't know until you do it, until you go through it. Just like everyone can tell you, hey, this is what it's going to be like to have a kid and late nights. And your life's not going to be your own. Oh, no, it'll never happen to me. I'm not switching my lifestyle at all. Well, kids come and then you're like, wow, I'm in bed at 8 o'clock now. Mm-hmm. And I'm not doing this or I'm not doing that. Same thing in the military. Yeah, you know, they you, you're listening to what they say, you raise your hand, you're vaguely aware. And mind you, most of us are probably 18 to 20 when we come mm-hmm. in, 18 to 25. So we're still pretty naive to the world mm-hmm. and to there are evils out there, to the evils that are out there, to the trauma that's out there, to the things that we may or may not have to do or may or may not see. But we shouldn't be defined by our scars. Hmm. It's what we do after the scars heal and close Mm -hmm. that defines us. And I think one of the things that we're seeing with a lot of, at least I'm witnessing now for the first time with being a part of this program is perception. And a lot of guys are living someone else's perception of them. 
And, and so, and I'll, I'll equate that. So you go to the VA and the VA says, oh, well, you've got a, you got PTSD. You have a combat disorder. So I'm going to hand you these pills. And then you're going to start taking these pills. And then you may be pissed off and have an episode. And shh, he's a vet. He can get that. He, you know, that's why he can get away with that. So you start believing. These guys start believing what they're being told. You know, it, that, hey, I'm a combat veteran. I got PTSD. Yes, they probably do. But it's how they're choosing to perceive themselves. Mm -hmm. And they start living someone else's perception. When they come here, we try not, we don't try and change anyone. That's not, that's not my purpose. That's not Micah's purpose. Mm -hmm. Our purpose is to expose them to new things. And one of the things that we do, in fact, that we decided to implement this year, Micah wanted to do it when he asked me to come aboard was teacher leadership class. Mm -hmm. Cause I've got a little bit of background doing that with the Marines. So, um, we instituted a leadership portion every night for the first, uh, every night of class. So the first five nights that they come in every night, we're going over a chapter in a book and we're just exposing them to a new way to think and dealing with their perceptions mm -hmm. because we want everyone who comes through the class, we want this to be there. And I hate calling it a class, but I have no, there's no other name for it, but every, all the program vets that come through, I want this to be their last stop done. No more doing fishing, hunting, ATV riding, whatever. All those programs are great. I'm not taking away from them. I want, I want people to understand that. But they don't address the problem. Mm -hmm. It's like taking a, an it's like putting a Band-Aid on a cut. You're just taking care of the symptom right then and there. You know, it's not stitching up the wound. So... We want this to be the last time, last program these guys come to. Because some of these guys are professional veteran seekers, program mm -hmm. seekers. Oh, last week I was fly yeah. fishing here. Next week I'm going to ATV riding. You know, no, hey, the buck stops here, guys. You're coming here. This is what we want for you. Whether you get it or not, that's up to you. Because it is about choice. And you'll hear Micah say, and I'm a firm believer of it, there's only two choices in the world. There's a yes box and then a no box. And it's really that simple. Mm -hmm. Yes, I accept these, this, whatever, or no, I don't. And I deal with whatever that may be. But that's very simple. I tell these guys, that's a very simple thing to say. It's just not easy to do. Mm -hmm. Difference between simple and easy. It's easy to say yes, mm -hmm. but it's not simple to do. Yeah, I... I kind of, you know, I've always come a little bit from that background and Ryan does too. You know, Ryan is obviously a big uh, proponent of suffering makes you better. Um, he's always been like that. And when he doesn't get that, he, you know, gets kind of complacent and apathetic, lazy, quote unquote, these things that he thinks happen to him when he's not actually pushing himself, you know. Um, even just with hunting and being in the back and the type of stuff he chooses to do, it's really all about the suffering. It's a struggle that makes him happier and it makes him probably a better hunter. It makes him a better father. It makes him uh, more patient. There's so many things about that. And I listened to Micah's, um, he just did a recent TED talk yeah, here he did in Bozeman. TED talks, yeah. Bozeman has TED talks. Yeah. Now. That's like, we're, we're, Bozeman's going up in the world. <laughs> it's growing. <laughs> so I watched it and, and kind of the whole purpose of his talk, if you watch that on YouTube was, um, you know, we have choices in our life and you can make, you, you know, obviously as the, as humans, we have a cerebral cortex that allows us to make ethical and moral decisions and choices for ourselves and not just live in an, our instinctual reptile brain, which we could if we were addicted to the pills and addicted to the alcohol and trying to numb our life out and wanting that dopamine hit all the time. It's easy to just live with the reptilian brain and not. But is that living? Well, I would say no. I, I agree with you 100%. Right? I would say no. But he was saying, you know, the choice is yours and that it's – you need to suffer because it's actually the suffering that the, makes you make better choices. Suffering and, gives – struggle and suffering give value. Yes. As the value is what consists of life. Right. 
And I think that's a very lost concept today. And maybe this is why I try to understand what is the mindset of people that want to go into the military? I remember when 9-11 happened, and I know Micah brought this up in his because he was actually there when mm-hmm. the, the, the Twin Towers fell, if you watch the, the video. Ryan was in the elk country of Idaho when the towers fell and didn't know it until he came out. And um, I remember after that, he became much more patriotic, I would say. He was always kind of like that. But he was never interested in the military because he would rather be in Alaska, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. Sure, I get it. Yeah, but uh, I remember him saying, you know, I should have joined the military. I should have joined the military. I should have done that. And it's so that's why I'm always intrigued by, you know, what is your answer? Why would you do that? And I can kind of see that in him. And he's not in the military, but he does go out and do these crazy things like by himself and really pushes himself to a point of, you know, exhaustion. And and I think that he would have likely may, maybe had been a good military person. You know, I his I, attitude and his yeah. drive is exactly what the military looks for. Yeah. He would have. Been. He he's like would have been a Navy SEAL. Yeah, like he, he would have had no. He likes he his own one problem is he doesn't like people telling him what to do. So. <laughs> well, he'd been just fine as a Navy SEAL. Maybe not a Marine Raider, but Navy SEAL. Yeah, but I I so that always intrigues me, right? Uh, why would what is it about that suffering? And when Micah talks about this is not a vacation, he said exactly what you said is is that a lot of these programs are not really rehabilitating these men. They're just giving them something else to think about. It's a distraction. And they're distracting them and they don't have choices. They're not suffering enough. And so this this program is not a vacation. And I love that. That's the hashtag. So tell me what the program consists of. Okay. So the program consists of three phases. Mm-hmm. The core program is phase one and two, and it's 40 days. And when these guys come, when they arrive here um, on day one, we in process them. And the first five days, they're learning, hey, this is a horse. It's got four legs. This is how you pet Morty or Fuzzy or Two Socks or any of the horses we have. Majority of our horses are Mustangs. And we have a, quite a, we have maybe a dozen mules now also as pack animals. So you're also rehabilitating horses yeah. that would have been thrown out. Been or- thrown out. Heroes and Horses is a, t- is a twofold story, the way mm-hmm. I look at it and kind of how I've distilled it now. It's the story of the unpurposed human being, the combat vet coming back from war. Mm -hmm. Because combat and the military, let me back up, our government does a really great job of creating warriors. We're very good. We know how to do that. For 200, what, 20 something years, we've been creating the best in the the best in the world. Right. But we're we're very bad at as a government, I I believe, is deconstructing these guys. Mm Mm-hmm. So when you join the military, you're given a purpose. And everybody in this life has to have a purpose. I'm firmly convinced of that. Uh, And that's part of the things that we tell tell people. Um, But you join the military, you're 18 years old, here you are. Hey, Private Franco, there you go. That's your your machine gun. You're the machine gunner. That is your responsibility. So for the next four years, I'm the machine gunner. That's my purpose. Got to keep that gun up. Got to keep it running. Uh, and then as I progress, if I'm going to stay in for however long next, now I'm a squat leader. Now I'm in charge of, you know, 13 guys, 12 guys. Then I'm a platoon commander. I'm in charge of 20 something guys, 30 guys. So the point being, you're always given a purpose. The military gives you a purpose and that's your job. And that's what you do for however long. But when you get out, now you're on the outside and society doesn't really have a purpose for you. Mm-hmm. What do I do? So a lot of them flounder, you know, and they get on to, and then of course a lot of them get PTSD or they claim they have PTSD and then the VA will either give you a bunch of pills and say, well, we saved his life. Mm -hmm. And uh, to your point about being in the lizard brain, I'm going to argue, did you really save his life? The guy's almost catatonic. Mm Mm-hmm. And he, he, they don't feel. You're replacing one. You're one, replacing one addiction for another. Uh, yeah, to me, it's mm-hmm. I replace the permanent death mm-hmm. with a living death. Mm-hmm. That's how Good I look at it. it. I, you know, yeah, you stop the permanent death, but you've now created a living death. They're literally the Walking Dead mm-hmm. when they're on these drugs. And what we see when they come to our program is most of these guys are their own volition. 
come off all their meds. And we have a week in there usually called crazy week Mm -hmm. where you see the detox, Mm -hmm. but it, it happens. And the change after it happens is amazing. You know, I'll read you. Now I'll, I'll continue on with it, but let me read you a little bit from a, one of our vets that went through the first class. Sure. 67 year old. So this is the first 40 days. First 40 days. Okay. Uh, this guy just wrote, wrote me yesterday and uh, he's a 67 year old Vietnam vet come through. So he, he's seen a lot, done a uh-huh. lot. Over the next 40 days, we were physically, mentally, and spiritually tested at every step. We went from before sunup to late at night, learning at a pace that would make an Olympic sprinter cringe. Horses, hitches, leadership, packing, trail riding, leading pack animals, shoeing horses, first aid, foraging, and on and on. We talked, we listened to our instructors, our horses, to each other in the mountains. Somewhere along the way, changes started to happen. I began to feel differently. For the first time in my life, I was proud of my service, and I took responsibility and accountability for everything that had occurred in my life. I can totally and honestly report, report that I am now symptom-free of PTSD. No longer do I have nightmares, intrusive thoughts, depression, or anxiety. I am happy, energetic, and loving life. I want to live every moment of every day. Life still has obstacles. But with what I learned at Heroes and Horses, I look at them as a challenge to overcome. I don't define myself by my past. However, I'm proud of it. But that is who I was, not who I am now. I think that really encapsulates the program. You know, we tell these guys, for some of you, this is your first chance. Mm-hmm. For some of you, it's your last chance. And we mean it. Because mm-hmm. some of these guys, if, if they don't make it through... I, you know, it's probably not going to be good for him. And this guy here. Um, he, so he was 67. 67. He was a vet of what? He was a Vietnam vet. He was a he Navy. Did. He was a Navy corpsman with the Marines. So he's lived over 40, 35, 40 years, years with this trauma. Of, of, of trauma, of shame. He was, he's he been in the VA every week for 30-something years. Mm. His... His VA counselor called us. I said, what did you guys do? Why is, why is he not coming back? I, he, he's a different person. What have you done? It's like, ma'am, all we did was our program. Mm-hmm. It's what we do. And it, he, he's called us repeatedly. He's coming to the gala. Mm-hmm. You'll meet him. He said, guys, you, you saved my life. Mm-hmm. And you can't put a price on that. I mean, the emotion that these guys come out with. We have one guy who's coming back, another guy from the first, from the second class, from our second class. He's coming to be the uh, student keynote speaker. This guy showed up. I, we have, you know, the guys were saying he's not going to make it. He's not, he's not going to complete this program. He's not going to make it. When he was done, you wouldn't recognize him. Mm-hmm. He looked 15 years younger, mm-hmm. cleaned it, cleaned up, shaved. I was like, Damn, cowboy, who are you? Because that wasn't who he showed up. He came off his meds. A couple of weeks there, it was, you know, the pinpoint eyeballs, taking the Lyrica, taking the Zoloft, taking the Xanax, taking yeah. all these things. And he finally came off of them and eating right, healthy, clean. You know, because part of our program is a, is a 360 degree program, too, is what so we're So it involves like so, diet and lifestyle. Absolutely. You can't, yeah. have, you can't have a clean. A clean mind without a clean body. No, you can't. And a clean body comes with clean food. Yeah. So we've instituted, and, we're, and we, we have a ways to go, but we're getting there mm-hmm. to kind of a Whole30 clean eating program there. There's no, you know, we don't do sugar there, uh, no processed food, no processed carbs, none of that. You mean you're not sitting around smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee and telling your story <laughs> and um, eating donuts? Im- imagine that. Oh. No, we're not. Um wow. No, it's uh, coffee. Well, there's coffee, but it's, well, okay, I we I have don't coffee. Mean to we can't bang on coffee, but not too much. But you know, their their hardest drink is cold water. Okay. So there's there's no drugs or alcohol, and these guys, frankly, are too tired at the end of the night. Mm-hmm. You know, you get your three meals. They're working from sun up to sundown. We do, um, we do yoga. 
We, awesome. we, we bring in yoga, and these yeah. guys actually, it's a, about a 50 50 mix. Some are like, this is amazing. Some of them are still pretty old school, like, I don't do yoga. <laughs> Yet after day two, they're like, hey, Rick, when's Ali coming back? Mm. I was like, oh yeah. So, so you're offering these things here in Manhattan, in town? No, or... we do it. We do it in you our do program. It in the back country. Yeah, we do it in the back country. How cool! Yeah, so we have a yoga instructor come two days a week, and then we do a conditioning hike okay. with the guys to kind of get them used to the elevation. Yeah. So going back, the first five days is all about horses, and by day two they're riding. Mm-hmm. So day one and two saddles. Day two they're riding. Day three and four they're learning to pack. And they're pulling, you know, their one pack animal with them and their mule and doing some trail rides on the property that we're at. After day five, they're the first seven days in the mountains on a backcountry trip. Wow. So they do about 120 miles. They come back. Then we ship them to the front range up by Lincoln mm-hmm. to do what's called ranch week. Mm-hmm. Where it's a change of scenery. They're working cattle on a, on a ranch. They're fi- fixing fences, mending fences, working cattle, roping, moving the cattle kind of a little break for them for a change of scenery they come back to us then we get into more advanced equine medicine backcountry medicine uh advanced packing techniques and they're getting ready for their 10-day trip to the bear tooth so this is all happening con- happening consecutively in 40 days absolutely no so breaks they are not getting a break there's no breaks oh wow. it, it, so then they come back that's why it's not a vacation right they come back uh they do their 40 they, they then do their 10 days to the bear tooth which is pretty brutal yeah um, but, it, but amazing. The but amazing. Tooth, sir. And what you find in the bear tooth, what I've seen with these guys over three classes now, I'm actually going this afternoon to pick up the last class, pick up Micah in the last class because he, he's on this last pack trip with them. Huh. Um, I've had guys, you know, in the first class, I've had guys that have carried their buddy's ashes from war with them for mm-hmm. four or five years. And finally they leave, they leave the dead bodies on the mountain. That's mm-hmm. what I tell them. It's like, guys, when you go up the mountain tomorrow and you head out on the mountains, leave the past. Leave the dead bodies up there. It's a good place for them. Yeah. Because if you're carrying the past with you, you're bringing, you're literally bringing death mm-hmm. into your life mm-hmm. and you will have no future. You can't go past it. Yeah. Leave it up there. And, and I don't know what it is, but something happens up there to these guys. They figure it out and they, change mm-hmm. and you see it in everyone i've seen it in every single guy 24 guys this year so last year was two classes of eight this year we grew three classes of eight to 24 wow and, and next year we'll probably try and grow we either stay at 24 depending on where we are uh as an organization because we have a lot of neat and exciting changes coming um but our goal is to grow our program so that's quite an endeavor, though. You know, 24 guys, that's 24 horses? That no, Or we, how many? So we have 42 horses. Okay. Now, we don't, we, classes one and two, we actually ran consecutively. Okay. So we had about 20, probably 25 horses tied up at one time. But then we rotate them. So this last class was all by itself. But one class takes 20 horses. That's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot of work. I mean, one horse is a lot of work. Yeah. That's 20 horses. That's also a lot horses. of resources. I mean, you need trailers for those, right? So, oh. And you guys are a nonprofit. Yeah. So th- this is all by donation? All or? by donation. Okay. Wow. We, we are exactly that. We're a nonprofit. So everything is by donation. We mm-hmm. are an amazing organization when it comes to in-kind donations. We have a great you know, followers that... Uh, and people that want to support that do a lot of in-kind donations. So the vehicles you see out there in the parking lot, those are all donated. Um, oh. This is, a, from my standpoint as a COO, this is just as challenging as setting up a forward operating base overseas. Because we don't have a ranch. We're using a ranch right now. Mm-hmm. We're fortunate enough to be able to use uh, a piece of property down south of Immigrant, uh, going towards the park, where yeah. it's what I call base camp. But these guys are in wall tents. So we got four wall tents. We have a yurt with a kitchen. We uh, Our shower is a little less than desired, but it's all somewhat by design to take the comforts away. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, these guys are showering out of an irrigation ditch, believe it or not, hooked up to a hot water heater. Showering? Come on. Who gets showers in the back country? <laughs> but they don't get in the back country. They get, we, we, we you get set, your shower. You get your one shower at base camp. Right. Um, 
and we have a lot of volunteers that help us out. Mm-hmm. But it's a lot of moving parts. I mean, we got yeah. trailers and trucks to move. We've got horses to move. Everything that's out there, we have to put up. We have to put when up. I think of a horse, I think of a horse. I think of a saddle. I think of a trailer. I think of horseshoes. I think of grooming, taking care of food, like one horse itself and then one person themselves. That's and just all the equipment all, that goes with that person. And all their equipment. Headlights, so, knives. Yeah. Sleeping bags, cots. Right. So they don't have to show up with anything, but they have to commit to the program, correct? Exactly. They they can show up in board shorts and flip flops if they want, and okay. we we'll, we we'll, we outfit them. Mm-hmm. You know, we get them hat, jeans, boots if they don't have it. And what happens if they slack? They lose their spot. No, you don't. I mean, you know what I mean? Like people that take advantage or they don't show up for something or they don't. Do you find that that happens or no? no? You find that people, they commit. These are military guys. So once they they say they're going to do it right. These guys commit. And you know what? The thing is that they want to be here. That's the biggest thing because I I don't have the full numbers on me, but we have. So 24 guys for Mm -hmm. the season, but we have close to 200 applicants. And are these from all over the country? All over the country. And they just come in for 40 days and they're here. They come in for 40 days upon graduation of 40 days. Uh Then I assign them, we assign them to what's called phase three, our reintegration phase. Okay. And it makes, for us, it makes sense naturally. We've developed a lot of relationships with outfitters and ranches and because that's kind of the Mm -hmm. community that we're in uh, to where these guys then go. We schedule them for four to six weeks. With either an outfitter or a rancher um, or a rodeo outfit, and they go and reintegrate, quote unquote, back into the, the work environment. By working. By working. Mm. Um, and that's once they complete that, then they truly have completed the entire program. Mm. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's giving them not just something to suffer with and to learn about, but it's also giving the option to find work and to find um, worth, I guess, in doing something. Yes. Taking what they've learned and applying it. Mm -hmm. And some some of these guys go on to continue to work for these outfitters or ranches, but we are giving them by doing the program. They actually are getting a life skill. Right. And as we continue to grow, one of the future plans that we want to have is one, we're going to buy a ranch. That's our Mm -hmm. goal. Next year, we'll start a capital. Actually, you'll probably have one within a year. We're going to start a capital campaign. Yeah. That's starting now. Mm -hmm. Um, Once we do that, then once we actually have a house, a home, so to speak, Mm -hmm. we can open up our program to so many more avenues. Uh, Mike and I have talked about it. We will always focus on our combat veterans Mm because that's where the mission started. But there's a lot of other people that can benefit from our process. Mm-hmm. There's nurses, doctors, paramedics, police officers, yeah. lawyers, CEOs. You know, I was reading a study last night. And, of course, statistics are just numbers, and you can probably pull anything up on the Internet. But almost 70% of the American population at one time or another will suffer a traumatic mm-hmm. uh, event. Mm-hmm. And I find those numbers to be staggering. But other people can benefit from what we do. We know we have a program that Yeah, works. I mean, the human condition is really, I mean, even like the, the, the mission statement that you have and the whole thing of suffering, improving your life is that unfortunately, and I see it in medicine, you know, a lot of people just kind of go through their life not really taking care of their health, not taking care of their body, their mind, whatever. And then something traumatic happens, like let's say a car accident or a diagnosis of cancer. And what is the first thing people do? It's like their eyes are opened to the fact that they may die and that they have mortality and that they need to start doing certain things if they want to stay alive or if they're going to survive this trauma, right? And then there's other people that spend a lot of their lives in traumatic situations and they go out in the world and do great things and they utilize those traumatic incidences to help other people. And then of course we know the flip side of that, right? They go out and perpetuate trauma on other people, which happens a lot. And, but I think the human, 
condition, there's a lot of suffering, whatever that is, but it sometimes takes that big thing to happen to wake people up. And so not, I think with veterans, you have, you have, you're, you're trained though, much differently than like the lay person would be right. You're trained like, okay, this could happen. This is what you're going to do. This is how you're going to take care of it. This is what's going to, maybe that's what's happening. But with lay people, you know, we're not teaching children how to take care of their bodies and blah, 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 blah. So when you're 16, you get a diagnosis of cancer and you could die. It's like, it can be such a huge, hard thing for you to do because you never ate healthy food. You don't know how to exercise. You, you um, may have chronic pain that, you know, you're just used to taking pain pills. Doctors do the same thing with lay people as they do with veterans. You know, you have sure. depression. Every, here you go. They don't want to take care of it. Everything today, more so than ever, than we were, than we were kids growing up, yeah. is designed to make life easy. Yeah. I got an app for everything. Yeah. When to wake up, when to eat, what to eat, what time to go to bed. There, everything in life is designed right now in our society today to take the struggle away. Mm-hmm. It really is. Yeah. And I think we as a society and we as people, we're we're forgetting how to struggle. A lot of us are. I mean, there's a segment that knows how to struggle. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that you want to struggle your entire life, but struggle does provide – if there's a struggle, it provides value. Anything We can all think back. Whatever had value in our lives, it was probably something that we struggled at. It was something that was hard, mm-hmm. something that we're most proud of. I mean, for me – some of my hunts, the harder the hunt was, the more that I got out of it, mm-hmm. whether I, cause I struggled at it, whether I was successful or not, you know, I'm sure like you, I've heard you saying, I've read some of the stuff, the harder the hunts are for Ryan, the more in, endurance it takes, the more the severity of the difficulty of it is, the more rewarding it is for mm-hmm. him. Mm-hmm. That's the same thing for anybody. Mm-hmm. If you had to struggle to get an A in school. Are you proud that you got that A or if it came really easy? Well, no big deal. Mm -hmm. So I I think that's the same thing, you know, um, today more than ever is a quote by Viktor Frankl, which I really like. Um, have you read any of his Mm -hmm. books? Yeah. So it says today, more people had the means to live, but no meaning to live for. Right. And I think that is a, a true statement. And we find with the guys that come through the program, they're looking for that meaning. Mm -hmm. And we can all search our society, everything that you see. We're all looking on the outside. It's easy to look out there. We're all searching for that answer out there. Mm -hmm. The answer's not out there. The answer's right in here. It's it's within. But that is hard. You know, being healthy. Being healthy is hard. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a choice. It all goes back to choice which is what we always, Mike and I always say, what's easier? You'll hear him say this, I'm sure, on the next podcast. You'll hear him say, what's easier, uh, donuts and Lipitor or 4 a.m. in running shoes? Mm -hmm. What's going to kill you faster, donuts and Lipitor? Yeah. What's harder, running shoes at 4 a.m.? Yeah. But what's going to keep you healthy? That's going to keep you healthy. I, You know, I I think definitely people don't have medications up deficiencies. That's, that's not a problem. You know, it, it's, it's that I do think there is a bit of a lack of will related to the, um, easy convenience of life and it makes you lazy. You know, it's, it's just like a muscle. If you don't work it out, it gets atrophied. It, it, it's kind of that the brain is the same way. Oh, I, and, absolutely. And I think too, it's interesting, you know, cause some of the research shows that people who do suffer from actual PTSD, their amygdalas shrink. And um, the amygdala is a part of the brain within the limbic system, right? That is part of our memory and our emotional state. And that um, the amygdala shrinks in people that have PTSD, which means you don't have that built up muscle, you're atrophied to a place where you can't even like one little thing now sets you off, right? Just, yeah. just one little hair or something will set you off because you don't have that impulse control, especially when it's related to anything that's a trigger. And I, it sounds to me like what happens and probably with any type of um, traumatic event is that once you create, once you create a space where people have to build that muscle, 
They have to use their brain in a way they create relationships because the limbic system is very tied into our emotional relationship and our relationship with memory. And it holds the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system, right? So fight or flight and rest and digest. And it's, I think that these programs probably help in a way that medication doesn't is that medication just dampens the symptoms. Um, but it's not creating a, it's not building a muscle anymore as far as it's not creating relationships that demand your brain to have an emotional connection to something. So that could be something as simple as that relationship with your horse, that relationship with your horse helps you have an emotional bond to something and therefore you're needed. And in that need, you build that part of your brain that remembers what it's like to feel needed and wanted, just like when you first went into the military, maybe, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's really interesting you say that because it just made me think of something talking about not we the the effects of PTSD mm-hmm. dampens that muscle. So we actually work that muscle out. We we you can't live in a world where there are no loud noises. You know, veteran safe space, no fireworks here. Yeah. That's not real life. So the example that comes to mind from this year is we were cracking a bullwhip to move a horse. And the guy, one of our guys kind of freaked out a little bit. Mm-hmm. Loud noise, sharp crack, some bullet noise, whatever. Well, you got to get past that. And the horses don't go past go until they get past that. Neither does the human being. So we're going to crack a bullwhip over and over and over again until it doesn't affect you like it doesn't affect the horse. Because mm-hmm. I don't want a loud noise to affect the horse when you're up on the up on the uh, a ridge line, and next thing you know, you're tumbling over the side. Same thing with human beings. Right. So I guess in some sense, we are actually trying to develop that muscle again, mm-hmm. getting that connection for that individual to realize and make that neurological connection that loud noise is okay. Car backfires. I'm not going to mm-hmm. hit the ground. I mean, to, to get past all that. And in, it's it's interesting in that same area of the brain, while you do that and while you get old, you're able to build that res- resilience, you're also better able to build your relationships and become more compassionate and more understanding and more loving because you kind of revert back to that place where maybe you lost some of that in the traumas, right? As sure. the brain starts to just compensate for the trauma and, you know, maybe quote unquote disassociate itself because it's got a lot of things it has to do. Yep. And when you're dealing with trauma, you need to just get through the trauma. That's what shock by nature does with our body. It, it allows us to actually get through traumas acutely so that we don't die or we mm-hmm. don't, you know, we were able to in that moment, but that's shock and that can be dangerous as well. But a lot of people I've noticed, especially through trauma or this, they, it's just like they're in a perpetual state of shock. They never come out of that shock and heal. It's as if well, shell shocked, right? Their yeah. brain is like shell shocked and they can't come out of that. And the limbic system is really needs that one, it needs compassion. It needs um, a relationship. It needs worth. So I'm worth something. And then it also requires that you are able to balance that to balance the need for fight or flight and rest and digest, you've got to learn how to do that. And even lay people who are having high stress jobs, like the CEO of a company who's, he's like in fight or flight all the time. And That's his sympathetic nervous system is wrecking him and it's not healthy. And so what does he do? You know, he snaps at his kids, he yells at his wife, he has to come home at night and have a whiskey to calm down. Just kind of the same compensation methods. And that's because that, that part of the brain. And I think that's what nature does. And that's why it's such a key component of healthcare that so many people are missing out on. You know, when you go into the back country, not only do you have the relationship with your horse and you're, you're, you're bit, you have to trust this animal to carry you and do a lot oh, for yeah. you. Right. And, and then you have to trust yourself that you can manage this animal. Then you have the relationship with the other guys in the unit, but you also, it's like, you 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 can go out there in a place where there's not tons of distractions you just you're able to have that re, those relationships and i think nature does that it kind of quiets you um like that quote you know we used to have really busy bodies and quiet minds and now we have busy minds and qu- and quiet bodies it's a great quote i'm going right? to steal that one and i forget who said it i'll 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 find out for you but it's it's just that 
I think that's too what nature does is it quiets the mind. And that's a piece of that limbic system. You need to kind of quiet it down and quit all this. Right. And trauma, like memories in that amygdala section, that's what it does. It's And your smell and your sound, all your senses are very in tuned into that system. It's like, you know, you smell something and it just flashes you back. Or oh, yeah. It triggers a memory. Sound, you hear something. Triggers yeah. a memory. So I find it, um, I, I feel like the drugs and I'm just, actually, I'm appalled at the way veterans are taken care of in this country. And well, we are too. That's I'll why be we the first exist. to say it. Like I see so many people that come in and they just, it's just appalling. And they actually have physical issues. They have health crises. Sure. They're not eating correctly. They're not taking care of themselves. And the VA, they're not getting the support they need except for maybe counseling and medication. And but, I think but, it's really hard to talk somebody out of a problem who's medicated and their brain's not, their brain is like fuzzy all the time. You said two things, counseling and medication. They can't do one without the other at the VA. Hmm. They want to give you a pill. Yeah. Want to give you a pill to fix it. Want to make life easy again. But it goes back to, for us, it's that you trade it one death for another. Mm-hmm. And that we would love to see an alternative. Mm-hmm. I mean, eventually you ask, hey, what, what are the goals? Where, do, where does H&H mm-hmm. want to go? We would love to see there's an alternative at the VA that, hey, guys, you can try the traditional route or you can try this. Right. Come come to Montana to back country for 40 days mm-hmm. and see what happens. And at least you, give them the choice. Do you feel like there's good success and when they go back into their lives, reintegration, that they're holding that, that they're – A lot of people ask that question. Yeah. Especially, you know, with the donors, they want to know, is this yeah. a quick fix or are they going to, you know – Next week after they graduate, are they going to go right back? To date, no one has regressed. Mm, Okay, now now let me say, just because you graduate the program doesn't mean life is unicorns and cupcakes and everything is rainbows and sunshine. I mean, it's real life. But what doesn't happen is they don't go back to where they were, to Mm -hmm. the bottle, to the pills. They don't go back to that state of zero. Mm -hmm. They still have to live life. They still have to struggle, you know, and we, we really embody that and we teach, we, we do teach them. We expose them to that. For example, tomorrow's nine mm-hmm. eleven. These guys are coming out at two o'clock today. They've been 10 days. They're exhausted. They are beat down right now. I'm going to wake them up at Mike and I are going to wake them up at three o'clock in the morning and we're going to drive them. We're going to hike Sacagawea peak for sunrise. Mm. And that's the symbology of that is. Great, you did 10 days in a bear tooth. That was yesterday. This is today. There's another mountain to climb. Mm-hmm. What's over the next mountain? Another mountain. So every day they understand that life is a struggle. There are mountains, there are obstacles. And it kind of goes back to our leadership portion that the ob- there's a book called The Obstacle is the Way. Mm-hmm. And that's the it's book. Good I, book. That's Everybody the book, should read. That's the book I teach out of. It's a good reference book, yep. too. It's, I, I call it teaching, but that's what we have discussions every night around the campfire. Oh, cool. And I pick a chapter and we discuss it. Yeah. And it seems, it always seems very appropriate for that day. For some reason, it just happens to work out that way. Right. Um, but the point being is that, you know, change, allowing them to choose how they perceive an obstacle, and that the obstacle can become the way. Look at it as a different, look at it from a different lens of the viewpoint. Mm-hmm. Look at how to do things differently. Um, and it will become your way to whatever you choose. Mm-hmm. And there's a reason that we have fear. It's a built-in mechanism within us to stop us from doing things that are dangerous, right? Like don't stick your hand on the stove. Like, sure. It's not going to be good for your hand. But we also have fear to help teach us that you need to work through this. This is something, you know, I always tell patients too, you know, f- fear and bravery kind of go hand in hand. And sometimes you have to be brave and just do it. And then you'll realize that you don't have the fear anymore. And, and, um, that can be the first hardest step for people is to go through the fear, right? Mm-hmm. Like the fear of the memory, the fear of the trauma, the fear of who's, who's going to care about them, the fear of the other side, the fear of having, you know, um, people love you again, like all the things that people have. I, I, um, I think that fear is that, Sometimes that essential thing you need. You have to, to have actually it. Ha- do it. <laughs> you have to have it. It, it, it. And the people that have no fear, those are the, that may be the thing with like the Navy SEALs and P- 
people that are doing crazy stuff and they have to keep getting that dopamine hit, you know, so they, they stop having fear and that that can actually be a detriment in a lot of ways. And I think that, um, that's also the other side. of That's the flip side. Fear has, you have to have a healthy respect for fear. Yeah. There has to be some or, or you become reckless. Exactly. And when you become reckless, at least in my former line of work, that's when people die. Yeah. And you always had to keep that in the back of your mind. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to be brave. It's another thing to be reckless and stupid, Mm -hmm. you know, and you're, you should always have in my mind, at least in my former life, you always wanted to have a little bit of fear, Yeah. you know, but you wanted to control that with nerve. You want to have a strong nerve, Mm -hmm. you know, the proverbial stiff upper lip, Mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to show it, but you can have it. Mm -hmm. Just keep it cognizant, but don't let it stop you. Right. So tell us, I know our time is up here. Unfortunately, we could talk for another hour. Um, Tell me about the gala and tell us how people can donate or help or learn more. Sure thing. I'll I'll wrap up on that. Um, So we're having our gala Mm -hmm. on 29 September here in Bozeman at the Rialto. I believe we only have maybe a dozen tickets left. Okay, I'm going to buy my ticket. Then. Get your t- my you're ticket buying yet. your ticket today. We'll I make am. sure that's going to yes. happen. Get your tickets. Okay. Um, that's one way. We're going to have some really neat things, uh, both live and silent auction. But other ways people can help us out are go to our website. Uh, there are many ways to help donate. You can adopt a horse. We have an adopt a horse program where you adopt one of our horses uh, for the year and monthly payments like that there's straight up donations to either the program mm-hmm. or to our capacity grant um, there's in-kind donations mm-hmm. we we are in need of vehicles good ones and trailers and anything that would help our program that would make sense mm-hmm. uh, you know i don't need i don't know i can't i can't think of anything right now but i i don't need a bunch of fly rods they don't work for our program all right darn i got a yeah. lot of those i so, can give you <laughs> so i'm just trying to think of something that would make sense for it right. um and you can donate through time mm-hmm. being a volunteer we for every single staff member so there's five of us here full-time staff it takes about 14 volunteers who are behind us to do camp tear tear down camp set up uh, horse Fridays, help us in the winter, ride our horses because we got to keep them going, yeah. clean tack, just reach out to us. Uh, and we, we love volunteers. So that, those are three ways you can donate or people can donate to help us with our mission. And next year we'll be having a capital campaign. So we'll definitely be looking for donations on that for our ranch. Okay. Um, and I'd never finished answering the question, but ultimately Heroes and Horses is just, uh, it's about the unpurposed veteran, and it's also about the unpurposed horse. I don't want to forget our partners, the Mustangs. Yeah, yeah. I'll touch on that real quick. So there is a huge problem in our country with the wild horses, and the government doesn't know what to do with them. Yeah. So they're in these huge lots across the West, uh, and those horses don't have a purpose anymore. So we go and we take them. We get new stock. We're going to get new stock this winter. And the ones that have had two years ridden on them, we'll sell them, give them to, sell them to good homes, good people. I mean, they're great horses now. But we get these wild creatures that have been, in, basically they're being put in captivity. They don't have a purpose. And we're, we're repurposing them. We're giving them a purpose. Their purpose is to help that combat vet. And together, those two animals, those two creatures, because that's what we are, they figure out their purpose in life and you know not to sound stupid but it's a pretty amazing thing to see when they realize that they're there for each other and it's mm-hmm. their purpose with each other yeah i've i've never been a horse person because i didn't grow up with horses i think my parents didn't have enough money for horses when i grew up here in gallatin valley it was mainly my friends had farmers or ranches they had horses and i never really had a an ability to to, to do a horse. Um, there's lots of organizations now, like I was sharing with you earlier for kids. And so my daughter will be able to go and she loves horses and be on a horse, but I don't have to like buy a horse, sure. you know, I, cause I may not be the best horse owner. I don't know how to manage horses, but I've always had this really, um, cause when my, my parent, my stepdad, he had some land out on the crow reservation and there were horses out there, wild horses. 
and we would go out there to family camp numerous times. And I've been up on the mountains camping and stuff and the horses. I mean, one morning I woke up and like the horses were like surrounding me eating on the hill and they're really amazing. They're just a, the energy of horses is like people, you know, they have a spirit and an energy about them that is really contagious. And I can see why people get like, why they love horses. You know, they're just, uh, as far as creatures go, they're so human in a lot of ways, you know. They have the, uncan- to me, a horse has an uncanny ability to reflect what's going on in you. They almost yeah. reflect your soul. I'm not a, ironically, I'm here at Heroes of Horses. I'm learning about horses. I rode as a kid, but it was mm-hmm. all English. So all cowboy style is somewhat new to me, Western style. Yeah. Um, I, I think a horse... It's, let me back up here. A horse is not, to me, a horse is not extremely intelligent, like a dog. Mm-hmm. I can train a dog to do 10,000 more things than I can a horse. Mm-hmm. But what a horse is, to me, is the most in, emotionally intelligent creature on the planet that I've come across. Mm-hmm. And that's why it works with PTSD, with trauma, with human beings, because mm-hmm. there is a real connection. You better, if you're angry, that day you wake up angry and you go get on that horse, stand by. That horse is going to be pissed off too. If you're timid, that horse will pick that up and feel it. So that's one of the things that we teach these guys is learn to lead yourself. They have to be leaders within themselves again mm-hmm. to lead that horse. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not for a horse. It's not natural for something to get on its back. Right. We are predators. Our eyes are in the front of our head. Horses are on the side. What gets on a horse's back? Mountain lions, mountain lions, bears, wolves. Yep. So there's a lot of trust that goes between the human and the horse to be able to get on a horse's back mm. and ride them yeah. and ride them in some pretty gnarly terrain at that. Yeah. But it, um, so I think horses are perhaps the most intelligent animal when it comes to emotions. They really reflect what's happening and you'll see it out there. Yeah. So you guys should come out when Ryan comes back, you guys should come. Totally. Check out, check out the camp. Well, camp will be yeah. torn down, but come, <laughs> come. We have a place uh, just in between Belgrade and Four Corners that we use. We okay. we do our training there in the winter time. Uh, definitely come check out the horses. Yeah, I'd love to. Absolutely. Sure. I I'm so appreciative that you contacted me and that we were able to throw this podcast together so fast. And um, for anybody who has been touched by this podcast and wants to help, you know, go to heroesandhorses.org. Um, and read more. Their website's great. The movie 500 Miles is on there. Um, have you seen 180 Out? I haven't. Watch 180 Out. Okay. I'll that's send a you a new one. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a Yeti film that was done about a year ago. Oh, it's a Yeti film. Yeah. Okay. So here you go. You're, you, you know me, guys. I'm not always on top of these things with the hunting and the outdoor world, but 180 Out. 180 Out's about the program. It probably encapsulates really well from a video standpoint. What we are, what's going on. Okay. I'm definitely going to go home and watch that tonight and I just appreciate it. And Uh, uh, we appreciate it. It's it's fantastic. (laughs) And you need to get on more podcasts. What is wrong with everybody? We're working on it. Uh, We'll get Micah in here next time. I'd love to do this again. I think uh, when Micah comes and look, if I can, I'd love to meet Ryan and I'm sure he and I can talk hunting all day long. Oh, let me tell you, Ryan, next time we do it with Micah, we'll have Ryan be here. Yeah. And you guys can all talk about that stuff. And um, I just love learning about – I really am attracted to people who – you sent me that text the other day, okay, let's change the world. Like I'm really attracted to people that have taken maybe something from a place that's really dark and really hard and – but they've also – They've worked their whole life to get somewhere. You know, it's like you look at these medals on the wall, you hear what you've done with your life. You know, that's a lot of work. It's a lot of persistence to be where you are. And then to see this kind of program be set up and the work and the persistence and the money and the dedication that it takes to keep something like this going. And it's really um, a labor of love. It is. I mean, because we're you nonprofit. Don't do this you don't do this for the money. Profit. You don't do it for money. And to see how well it's working and <clears throat> the bottom line is I'm just attracted to anybody who wants to help people and help animals and, you know, spread the message that humanity isn't all that bad. No, it's you not. You know, that we 
I would say the majority of people have good hearts and that we don't want people to be suffering and be walking around with their trauma so that they can go induce trauma on other people. We want to help those people. And um, when I see stuff like this, it just really touches me and it it makes me excited um, for, for the human race. (laughs) No, you'll, you'll read on my bio. You, you pretty much encapsulate what I just said. I've seen a lot of darkness out there, but I do believe there's a light that needs to shine and it can be found in everybody. Yeah. For the most part. And that's that's what we're trying to do just for for our guys, for the for our brothers that have suffered and are going through this, or if you're listening and you know a, a vet that needs it, have them apply. Mm-hmm. Go online, apply. We're taking applications now. Um Okay. Are you gonna do it for women? We ran a pilot we did not do run. Do women suffer the same way as men? They suffer. I don't know. I can't say if they suffer the same way because I'm not a woman. No, but I mean, but, do you see as much PTSD in women as men? Yeah, you do. Actually, okay. you probably see more. More. You yeah. see more because there's the, the whole sexual assault trauma. Yeah. So yeah. statistically, you see um, a lot more with women than men. Do we have plans as a, our organization? Not right now. We're not okay. there yet. We did run. We did partner with Seren- uh, Serenity Ranch. They ran a pilot course under our tutelage, a all women's course. I think they had six women come through, mm-hmm. um, and it was a, a two week course, uh, maybe a week to two weeks, mm-hmm. um, at the Serenity Ranch. And all accounts, uh, unfortunately, I wasn't that involved with it because mm-hmm. of, I'm running this program. But we did mentor them and guide them and kind of help them out, mm-hmm. um, and it went well. Wow. So I think we'll see that program grow. I, th- I think it might be hard for women to take 40 days out of their life because women tend to be the ones home taking ch- care of children, right? Absolutely. No, they have I, different circumstances usually um, when it comes to family. Yeah. So it's hard. So yeah. we want to cool. see it grow Yeah. for sure. For, for like I said, other, other groups, other people out there. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, we'll end on that. This has been great. Um, and yeah. I don't have anything else to say. No, thank you. I appreciate it. Until next time, guys. Okay. Take care. Yep.